All right, so I keep running over time in class, and we're going to try a new method. Um, you can use this video, send it to you, see what happens. Um, we're wrapping up um, Rauschenbusch's theory of the kingdom of God and arguing for why um, it needs a theological backing and what sort of theological backing um, it might um, require. And so we said that first is um, the kingdom of God is divine in origin, in progress, and in consummation. Um, its beginning begins with Jesus' Jesus's ministry on earth, and um, that initiates the kingdom of God on earth. It is here now. It is being refined, but it's here now. Um, it's progress, this continuing revelation, what sustains the energy to build it. Um, Rauschenbusch gives credit to the Holy Spirit for that model, um, for that for that idea, and then it's fulfilled um, by God and his sort of supreme authority to actualize it in the future, to cons consummate it. Um, because it's divine in origin, um, it has some, some subtext. One is that it's miraculous all the way. Um, in class, we talked about um, one of the ideas that I'm, I'm really trying to formulate um, and articulate in some upcoming um, writings is the idea that um, anything that is supernatural is miraculous and that our only limits um, in this view, the, the thing that limits our sort of imagination is we like to think of supernatural things as sort of happening once every while, blue moon. Um, and in fact, anything that's not natural is supernatural. And so one of the ideas that I've been working with um, is that if it is natural for you to be greedy, and you're not greedy, that's a miracle. And it's just as much a miracle as anything else, any suspension of any sort of um, any order of the universe. And in fact, to even talk about it that way is incorrect because you do suspend the order of the universe when you give away your money to the poor or when you feed someone who's hungry. Unless that person was going to be fed by natural means, um, then they were fed by supernatural means. And so that's the, you know, and we'll be talking in, in the coming weeks about um, H. Richard Niebuhr's per, um, argument that about the grace of doing nothing and that all inaction is actually action and that, it, um, and that different inactions, different modes of inaction are preferable to others. Um, and perhaps um, that'll relate to our conversation about the supernatural. The kingdom of God is divine, therefore it's miraculous. And therefore, it requires salvation from God. It's very important for Rosh and Bush that your personal salvation, um, your personal redemption, happens by way of your redemption of the social. And that the social is redeemed by way of expanding um, those who are personally redeemed. And it has this sort of cyclical effect, I think. Um, third um, is that it's a theological idea, not just an ethical idea. Liberal Christianity, um, it's very easy for them to fall into that camp, to fall into the sort of social justice thing without the theology thing, without the myth thing. Um, Rauschenbusch is having none of that. Um, the kingdom of God is a theological idea, and as we talked about in class today, it's necessary to believe it's a theological idea. If you want to be able to give a moral act its religious quality, um, a moral act is self-serving unless it's serving a greater purpose. And that greater purpose is almost always an imagination, a vision of what the world would look like if everyone did that. And that's the kingdom of God. That if you imagine a world in which everyone helps little old ladies across the street, and that's your purpose for helping that little lady across the street, then that experience has a religious quality in and of itself. Um, he says that, you know, Rajabu says that schemes of redemption and systems of ethics are no good um, without... Um, a true Christian theology. Um, later, Niebuhr will be adamant about this in terms of its um, the inspiring idea, the sort of fervent, fanatical energy necessary to maintain the project of building the kingdom of God. The only reason to do it is that you have a divine purpose and a divine vision for that. Um, and even if, you could argue, even if that's a humanitarian purpose, even if you are an atheist humanist, that in trying to set up the, a, a place where humans are taken care of and loved and treated as equals, that we go back to that render under Caesar argument that simply says, well, you could argue that 
humans are made in God's image. When you love humans, you love God. And though you are not articulating your your humanism, your secular humanism in theological descriptions, you could argue existentially, as we'll see when we when we read the Tillich section, you could argue existentially that you are serving God um, and you are building the kingdom of God. And in fact, it does have a religious quality um, because love of humans is love of God. Um, so we move on. The second reason, um, second suggestion for theology of the kingdom Rauschenbusch gives us is that it, it, it has a teleology of the Christian faith. And that simply means that there's an end in view and that Christianity for Rauschenbusch is not stagnant. It's not passive. It's dynamic. It's constantly being revealed and moving forward. And so there's no reason to be actively involved in projects unless Christianity has a teleology. And that teleology, biblically, for Rosh Hashanah, the defense of that position is that it is the kingdom of God. Um, so that just simply means that we're moving forward. We have an end in view, as we talked about in class. It's not potentiality, it's possibility. It's an end in view that's, that's it's there. We have an idea of what it will look like, but it's murky and foggy. And, and that means that the means by which we achieve it, um, we can be inventive with them. We can be imaginative with them. They don't just have to be the means necessary to build, for, for example, a temple on this place in Israel, um, which is the sort of potentiality vision of the, the kingdom. Um, but um, by sort of just positing it, knowing some of the values and principles that it has and putting it out there, um, we're able to discuss the means. Politics becomes involved. We're able to participate in that sort of negotiation of how we're going to do it. And radical new means may, may become available to us if we have a sort of open possibility of what that kingdom is going to look like, that we're not sort of stringent about what it has to look like. We don't force it. Um, so it's better that the vision not be clear as opposed to having a clear vision of what we're building. Um, because when you have a clear vision, then you get the Exodus 32 politics where we can do the sort of violent purging and the vanguard um, can just do the radical violent revolution because the ends are worth it because you know what they are. But if you get rid of them, you don't know what they are. They're sort of murky. Well, no one's going to commit a Holocaust or a genocide based on some murky, unclear end. Um, so you end up sort of being protective of yourself in that process. Um, Rauschenbusch argues that there are steps. Though we don't know what the end is, there are steps to achieve it. And there are certain things that it can't coexist with. We know that. that this is here. This can't be here. And one is sin. And so Rauschenbusch simply says that bef like, before we could even begin possibly fleshing out a real vision of what it might be, the first thing we have to do is redeem the world from evil. And that means being in conflict with evil um, without defining what that evil is yet. But we know that we have to be in conflict with evil. Um, and only once we've been in conflict with evil and redeem the world from evil, not Eh, not, it's kind of bad, but true evil. Um, then can we do the next two steps, which he argues are the education, religious education of all humanity, and the revelation of God's life within the world. Um, demonstrate to people how God is active in this moment and in this moment. But none of that can be done unless we are in a radical contention and conflict with evil here in the world. As long as radical evil exists, racism, hatred, injustice at a mass level, um, that should be our focus. None of the other things can happen until that point happens. The third um, suggestion for the kingdom uh, that Rauschenbusch offers is to um, understand that any theology of the kingdom posits the kingdom as always both present and future. The reason for that is, if your theory about the kingdom of God postpones redemptive action, then it isn't valuable. It's only a theory, and it doesn't have any impact on reality. So if you say one day, when we get to the kingdom, we'll live this way, you're postponing redemption. Instead, what you should be doing is laboring for it. And you labor for it, in faith, that it's coming as you're laboring, 
and this laboring reveals new possibilities for the end. And so here you can see that that model we discussed today in class um, from John Dewey is sort of like, it's the working on the end that helps the end come into vision. That new vision of the end then changes the method by which we work on the end. That articulates a new end. And so you see this sort of constant experimental scientific method of kingdom building um, that is at the heart of Dewey's vision and is not drastically different from Rauschenbusch's in that sense. Though Rauschenbusch would never put it in the terms of, of empiricism or scientific method. Um, the fourth thing is that, and this gets back to the notion I mentioned about the atheist, humanist, secular humanist. He says the kingdom of God is present in every idealistic interpretation of the world. Every utopian vision for a just society is a vision of the kingdom of God. What Rauschenbusch wants to make sure that we understand is that it's Christ that gives it its unique character. And so, going back to the problem with putting the church in the position of the kingdom, we can see here clearly that um, it's about Christ, that Christ almost never mentions the church. He mentions the church only twice um, in his recorded sayings. Both of those, we think, were um, falsely um, edited additions to those who wanted church to rule over the state later um, in the canonization process. Um, Jesus didn't talk about church politics. He talked about kingdom politics. And, and so it's Jesus' words that give us a vision of what that might be. Um, and that vision, though still muddy, has certain principles. Those principles must come from, from Jesus. Um, and that means we have this. One, it's worldwide. It's global. It's not Jew, Gentile, Greek. It's everyone. Um, it's spiritual. It's not just material. Its purpose is, um, is salvation of the world and of individuals. And it is, um, excuse me. <laughs> um, and it is J Jesus who foretells it and initiates it. Um, and so that's, for him, it all comes back to, to the gospel, and as we'll talk about at the end of this video, Gutierrez and Oscar Romero sort of um, filling in the gaps that Rauschenbusch leaves open here. Um, he says that the importance of idealistic interpretations of human destiny are that we develop a racial consciousness in modernity, um, as we develop a racial consciousness in modernity, um, is vital that as we begin to be aware of the different nations and as we begin, as the globe begins to expand and as racial consciousness awakens and not just the idea of race, but the idea of unjust race relations, as all of these things sort of start appearing and as the world gets bigger and we start becoming more aware of all the, the sort of communities in conflict, um, the, the kingdom becomes more important than ever to sort of bind us together. Um, and hold us together. It organizes our common humanity um, toward what he calls the will of God. And then he outlines what that will is. What is the will of God? He says it's God's will that social order guarantees all personalities their finest, their freest and highest development. Um, the, at Yale in the early 20th century um, and coming out of um, sort of William James's pragmatic vision, coming out of that movement into the 20th century, personality becomes a concept of great importance. Um, this idea that who you are truly meant to be, this sort of authentic self um, that we've talked a little bit about in class, um, becomes, you can even see it infiltrating. Um, I, don't, I don't know that, I don't know that Rauschenbusch is entirely biblically correct to make the argument that personality is as important as he does, but he is a product of his times, and personality is a concept during that time. Um, and so for him, God wills that a society that you live in, the kingdom of God, will be a place where whoever you truly want to be, your, your highest development, the highest thing you can be, the best, the best Joe you can be, um, and the freest way for you to become it. If you have that, then you have the kingdom of God. Um.
this is redemption from human beings become means to others ends and for him you should only be a means to your own ends mutual self-actualization um, is a priority um, the second thing god's will is the progressive reign of love and human affairs um, we'll be talking about that momentarily and that reign of love, um, he says, is um, is the end, and the means then becomes redemption from, and he gives us a list, political autocracies, economic oligarchies, substitution of redemptive justice for vindictive, punitive justice, abolition of constraint through hunger and industry, and the abolition of war. So, he's not vague on it. There it is. That's what you got to do. Um, God's will is for those things. Um, God's will is that um, no one have dominion over other people um, in a way that limits their freedom or their potential um, self-actualization, ergo political autocracies and economic oligarchies. God's will is that um, when people do wrong, they have the opportunity to redeem themselves and to return to society a new man or woman um, with a new vision of goodness. Um, and that we help them and support them, not that we um, are vengeful toward them, not that we punish them out of anger or hatred or um, a sense of justice or that we're right and they're wrong. Um, God's will is that we abolish all hunger, um, and especially all hunger um, that is um, the product of industry, and then that we abolish war. That's Rosh Bush's statement. Um, articulation on that um, and this general theme is about to find itself repeated over and over as we get into Gutierrez and Romero and Bonhoeffer um, and even Niebuhr's critique of Augustine will involve um, the idea that the highest expression of love that God's will is um, the complete surrender of the self and that means martyrdom it may be he says that um, Rauschenberg says a moderate expression of love such as the surrendered opportunity to support and exploit others um, should be the first thing we think about. And that's something worth thinking about. Surrendering the opportunity to exploit others, i.e. giving up any rights that you may have or legislation that might have been passed that says you can, um, that even makes it possible for you in a moment of maybe moral blindness or distractedness or self-concern for your family and loved ones to exploit others. Even if you were, you want, you don't just want to eliminate your choice to do that exploitation. What you want to do is eliminate a system that would even allow you to do it if you wanted to. So you take away the the means, and you can't you can't do it. Um, as far as the systems that set up the exploitation or that allow it, um, Roger Bush lays out two specifically that must be abolished for the kingdom of God to be actualized. And one is we must be redeemed from the ownership of natural resources by private persons. Two, um, we must be redeemed from any conditions that make monopolies possible. Next, Russian Bush. Rauschenbusch argues that um, since the kingdom of God is the supreme end of God, that all the problems of personal salvation must be reconsidered from the perspective of the kingdom. I like this because he compares it to various options. Early Greek thought posited that salvation was the purpose of God. If salvation is the purpose of God, then what must be, re be redeemed from? We must be redeemed from ignorance, and we must be redeemed from earthliness. If those are the things we must be redeemed from, what are the means by which we redeem ourselves from them? We are redeemed from ignorance and earthliness by the revelation of God and his promise of immortality. So that's where we get the emphasis on incarnation and resurrection. That, that God became man becomes the primary theology, and that God um, died again, that, that God um, defeated death becomes important. Um, in doing that, in accepting it and believing it, we are saved. We are redeemed from our own incarnation and our own death.
likewise, Western theology posited salvation as redemption from sin, as opposed to redemption from what? In order to redeem us from sin, um, what are the means? Well, the means of Western theology have been forgiveness of our guilt and grace from punishment. And here we get that sort of Pauline emphasis, much of what I grew up on, Protestant Christianity, the idea that um, we want to emphasize not the incarnation and resurrection, but the death and the atonement. Um, this is sort of passion, the passion of Christ focus, right? That, um, that, that he pays the cost for us, and so we are not guilty, and we are free, and, and we've been forgiven because he paid the cost. You get the sort of, and this is what Agamben will talk about, as I mentioned, um, this sort of economic model. The Western model of theology and salvation has been an economic model based upon atonement, debt, guilt, payment paid, sacrificial lamb sort of business. Um, and 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 Rauschenbusch is adamant that that's not the way. Um, the supreme end, the goal, salvation comes when the kingdom of God is on earth. That means redemption comes from in getting rid of institutions and situations that prohibit God's will from being actualized. God's will is the surrender of selves and the expression of love. And so what prohibits that? That's where we get back to those natural resources and private ownership and monopolies and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, with that said, next, Rauschenbusch argues that um, since the kingdom of God is the supreme end of God, that all the problems of personal salvation must be reconsidered from the perspective of the kingdom. I like this because he compares it to various options. Early Greek thought posited that salvation was the purpose of God. If salvation is the purpose of God, then what must be, re be redeemed from? We must be redeemed from ignorance, and we must be redeemed from earthliness. If those are the things we must be redeemed from, what are the means by which we redeem ourselves from them? We are redeemed from ignorance and earthliness by the revelation of God and his promise of immortality. So that's where we get the emphasis on incarnation and resurrection. That, that God became man becomes the primary theology, and that God um, died again, that, that God um, defeated death becomes important. Um, in doing that, in accepting it and believing it, we are saved. We are redeemed from our own incarnation and our own death. Likewise, Western theology posited salvation as redemption from sin, as opposed to redemption from what? In order to redeem us from sin, what are the means? Well, the means of Western theology have been forgiveness of our guilt and grace from punishment. And here we get that sort of Pauline emphasis, much of what I grew up on, Protestant Christianity, the idea that um, we want to emphasize not the incarnation and resurrection, but the death and the atonement. Um, this is sort of passion, the passion of Christ focus, right? That, um, that, that he pays the cost for us, and so we are not guilty, and we are free, and, and we've been forgiven because he paid the cost. You get the sort of, and this is what Agamben will talk about, as I mentioned, um, this sort of economic model. The Western model of theology and salvation has been an economic model based upon atonement, debt, guilt, payment paid, sacrificial lamb sort of thing. All right, let's talk about Gustavo Gutierrez and his Latin American liberation theology. Option for the poll. Um, we get some good concepts with this, this reading we did, um, and one is the, the actual idea of poverty. Um, it's, it's important not to just go, oh, well, I don't have any money, I'm poor. Um, the preferential option for the poor Gutierrez outlines um, addresses three forms of poverty. One is real poverty, which he simply calls evil. Um, spiritual poverty, which is the availability to the will of the Lord, and solidarity in poverty, um, which is sort of vicarious poverty. These are sort of three concepts and ideas of poverty that, that we must choose and address fundamentally. Um, and we say, why? Well, because God chooses the poor. And that's why. 
the theology part. So Rauschenbusch, right? He wants Rauschenbusch wants us to go back to Christ. He doesn't really outline all of Christ's stuff. He talks about a few institutions that have to be overthrown or gotten rid of before the kingdom of God comes, but he doesn't really talk about like how does one be in this kingdom of God and and what sort of means and visions can we have in the moment to get to the big thing. Um, and I think that the the position of Gutierrez and the liberation theologian seems to be that. If you're focusing on the end, the kingdom, its murkiness, it's hard to engage in everyday ethical behavior. Everyday choices become wide open to you. That's good in the sense that imaginative, radical new possibilities can emerge. Um, but it's bad in the sense that it doesn't really give us any real strong, lots of things can be justified based upon this kingdom. Um, and Jesus' words aren't always so perfectly clear about what means are necessary and available. Um, and so so the response of liberation theology and the response of the Catholic Church um, in the encyclicals and the social teaching um, that have been released is simply to return in some ways to the Beatitudes and to focus on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and, and so when we say, well, there's lots of things you could do to build the kingdom of God, why this one? Um, the preferential option for the poor is the option God chooses from liberating Hebrew slaves in Egypt to Jesus' mission on earth. God chooses poverty. He chooses the poor, and he prefers them. And then he articulates it um, and establishes the kingdom, begins its consummation on earth um, when, he are, when, he, when he gives the Sermon on the Mount, and so it all comes back to that. Um, so, um, the next concept, aside from poverty, um, well, before I move on, let me say this. It's important to remember that for Gutierrez, poverty is a way of life. It's not something we just, it's not, it's so important that we get out of the material definition of poverty. The material, the real poverty has to be addressed, but poverty is death. Poverty is suffering, and poverty is something we enter into and choose it daily. And so that gets back to the means that we choose. How do we decide? If, well, every day I wake up and I go, today I'm in solidarity with the poor. Every day I wake up and I say, today I choose the poor. I choose to be poor. I choose to serve the poor. I choose to love the poor. I choose to, and that means poor in spirit, poor in everything that poor means, and we'll outline it. Um, that means addressing those who are poor every day, choosing it, preferring it. Um, preferring to be poor over being rich in anything. Um, so, um, in many ways, Gutierrez is going to outline a, a politics based upon the Beatitudes, and it's worth noting that um, when, when we get to Nima next week, um, he is going to just flat out reject the crap out of this. Um, but it's worth noting, um, because if one thing is certain, um, not only in Latin America over the past 20 years, but um, the mission and, and witness, we could call it a witness, of um, Martin Luther King and, and Gandhi has been to demonstrate um, the inadequacy of, of Augustinian, Niburian Christian realism um, and to show that, no, that's not, that's not true. You just haven't been as imaginative as you could be. And that you think violence is necessary doesn't mean anything about the state of politics or the natural state of the world that you think violence is necessary is simply um, the, the only thing that tells me is that you don't have any imagination that you haven't thought long and hard about creative new ways to do things and that there's lots of cool ways to to use love politically um, and you just you're just lazy Essentially, you're lazy. And it's funny because Niebuhr is the one person who calls for, and which later Obama will use to, to call for, the expansion of our moral imagination. Um, and in fact, you could argue that a Gutierrez type critique of, or even a John Dewey type critique of Niebuhr is that you don't have, you have, you have moral imagination perhaps, but um, in terms of who we should treat morally, um, other nations, other people, but you lack political imagination in that you think the only way to do politics is to be 
um, means end oriented and the only way to do politics is with power and to use power or you have a limited conception of power you lack the imagination needed to truly understand power and how it works um, but to get back to Gutierrez um, he notes that the Beatitudes are dialectical they're always followed by woes um, and that we prefer poverty over wealth hunger over satiety suffering over self-satisfaction the despised versus over the important the invited over the uninvited um, and he uses the, uh, the wedding banquet story to demonstrate that which I really like um, the righteous versus the sinners um, the sick and lamed and diseased and despised over those who are preferred. Um, so Gutierrez is calling for a church of the poor and that that church of the poor requires a few things. One is discipleship. And, and, and Gutierrez points out that Matthew's Beatitudes are different than Luke's Beatitudes. And while there are political reasons for that, that we know of historically, um, and Richard, I think Richard Selby, who's, a, no, John Shelby Spong, his book on biblical literalism points to this. Uh, but there's been a lot of work in this area. We know, we know why Luke's Beatitudes are different than Matthew's. Um, but Gutierrez doesn't do that. He doesn't reject it. He appreciates it. And he takes it in and he says um, that the, the Matthew Beatitudes are about personal discipleship and that Luke's Beatitudes are political and about serving the greater good. And, and go back to Rauschenbusch's idea about personal salvation and redemption coming from social salvation and redemption and the two going together. And here we have it that, you know, it's the poor in spirit in Matthew's Beatitudes that serve the materially poor in Luke's Beatitudes. And you have to have both. And Matthew's Beatitudes are a model for personal discipleship. Luke's Beatitudes are a model for political action um, or political values and preferences. Um, i.e., um, Gutierrez's words, is that Matthew's Beatitudes are about creating the disposition necessary to participate in Luke's Beatitudes. And I really like that, that two-fold model. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, in addition to discipleship, it requires a sense of mercy, and it requires us to be single-hearted. And I like this a lot, too. He, he goes out of his way to talk about the double-souled and the devious people who say one thing and do another. Um, who prefer the poor in speech, but don't prefer the poor in their actual politics. Um, um, so I want to talk about this single-heartedness thing, and then I'll um, we can conclude and move on from good years. Um, but I just wanted to close with um, one section from um, his book on a theology of liberation, because this idea of sincerity and single-heartedness is going to get to the heart of the martyrdom question that we're going to be dealing with with Bonhoeffer coming up cost of discipleship, etc. So Gutierrez says, it is true, however, and it is true that we must pay a high price for being an authentic church of the poor. I am referring not to the cost entailed in the manner of life and action proper to the church, but to that inflicted by the hostile reactions the church meets in its work. In present-day Latin America, this means frequent attacks on the church and its representatives, and more concretely, the determination to hamper their mission, undermine their reputation, violate their personal freedom, deny them the right to live in their own country, make attempts against their physical integrity, even to the point of assassination. The experience of the cross marks the daily life of many Christians in Latin America. The murder of Archbishop Oscar Romero was undoubtedly a milestone in the life of the Latin American church. This great bishop risked his life in Sunday homilies and in interventions that responded to first world pressures by continually calling for a peace founded on justice. He received death threats. A month before his own death, he said with reference to those in power, let them not use violence to silence those of us who are making this demand. Let them not continue killing those of us who are trying to bring about a just distribution of power and wealth. I speak in the first person because this week I received a warning that I'm on the list of those to be eliminated next week. But it is certain that no one can kill the voice of justice. End quote. He died. They killed him for bearing witness to the God of life and to his predilection for the poor and the oppressed. It was because he believed in this God that he uttered an anguished, demanding cry to the Salvadoran army. Quote, In the name of God and of this suffering people, whose, willing, whose wailing mounts daily to heaven, I ask and beseech you, I order you, stop the repression. The next evening his blood sealed the covenant. 
be a neighbor of God, of his people, and of his church. Martyrdom, in the broad sense of the term, is the final accomplishment of life. In this case, it was a concrete gesture toward the poor, and therefore an utterly free encounter with the Lord. Those who have given and are now giving their lives for the gospel demonstrate the consistency that the gospel demands. The Apostle St. James warns us against the danger of being double-minded, dipsychos, that is, of speaking in one way and acting in another. What brought Jesus to his death and is bringing his present-day followers to their death is precisely the coherence of message and commitment. It has traditionally been said that the church is enriched by the blood of the martyrs. The present vitality amid distress of the people in Latin America is due in great part to the same experience. The coherence of message and commitment, the single-mindedness, the commitment to the vision is what leads to Gandhi's death, Dr. King's death, and Oscar Romero's death, Bonhoeffer's death, and and. There's no mincing words about this for these thinkers. If you're not being threatened with death, if your very being is not at risk, you're not being revolutionary. You're not committed to the gospel. You are a hypocrite. You're double-mouthed. There's no... It's almost like the test of your commitment is that, that, that those in power are threatened by you. And it's, what, and it's what Niebuhr will call the law of Christ, the, the law of the logic of the cross, the absurd logic of the cross, is that those who truly love the way Christ commands us to love in such a way that the world which is not built on that love cannot contain them it can't permit them it can't allow them they can't coexist together because one is so pure and holy and righteous almost like Christ it, it, it cannot exist in a world and a corrupt world will destroy those who love perfectly it will always kill them and so I think Rauschenbusch and I think Gutierrez and I think that um, even Niebuhr suggests this at times, point to it, call for it, demand it, um, and simply it becomes this sort of check. And so we talked about the balance of principles. That we'll be talking about principles that check principles. And so you know, Augustine says love is the principle. Niebuhr says, well, if you make love your principle, you're unable to make distinctions based upon justice. So you need justice, and then love checks justice. And both Niebuhr and um, Gutierrez and Rauschenbusch agree on this fact, that if you think you're loving perfectly, you can check that with a higher principle, which is more loving. So I wanted real quick, um, I'm pretty obsessed with this book. It's a collection of homilies by Oscar Romero. Um, Romero was uh, martyred, assassinated in 1980. Uh, he was in uh, El Salvador for three years. And, uh, and while he was there, he became um, a radical leftist um, thinker and, um, and a threat to power. And I wanted to just read the small excerpt from one of his homilies. The guarantee of one's prayer is not in saying a lot of words. The guarantee of one's petition is very easy to know. How do I treat the poor? Because that is where God is. The degree to which you approach them, the love with which you approach them, the scorn with which you approach them, that is how you approach your God. What you do to them, you do to God. The way you look at them is the way you look at God. February 5th, 1978. That, the, the way you look at them is the way you look at God. And it's fascinating that this Latin American theologian who's trying to address the hypocrisy and double-tonguedness of people who say they prefer the poor and do not prefer the poor. And he talks about the way you look at them, the stranger, the dispossessed, is the way you look at God, um, and returns full circle to our first week's reading um, on Levinas and the gaze of the other that calls us to respond, um, the stranger, the alien, the foreigner among us, um, who it's the look and the way we look at them is the way we look at God. And I think it's an interesting sort of correlation between the two things. Um, it sets the stage nicely 
um, moving forward for next week when Augustine, um, when when Niebuhr using Augustine rejects all of these arguments in many ways. Um, and that concludes our experiment on there aren't enough lectures in the week for Dr. Rhodes to ramble in the class. And so we had to add a 45 minute lecture to this week to get us back on schedule. Um, but hopefully um, it works. Let me know what you think when we're done. Um, I'll, I'll see you next week. We'll, we'll begin with Niebuhr and make sure that you've read um, the debate he has with his brother. I think the H. Richard Niebuhr debate is fascinating. Um, I, was, I was looking at it this morning and reviewing it. Um, this grace of doing nothing article, how do we do nothing? Um, and the, the idea that there's a few different ways to do, to be inactive and, and not all inaction is equal. Um, and he talks about different forms of action. I just, it's a really good essay. I'm super pumped to read um, with you all um, the debate between H. Richard Niebuhr and Reinhold Niebuhr about what should be done. And then also the um, Stanley Auerbach about um, after September 9-11th, the pacifist response to 9-11 um, is very important um, sort of conclusion of that discussion. Um, so have a good weekend. I will see you next week.